thanks, uh, uh, Shai Lavid, for, for joining us as well. It's a great pleasure, uh, given we know uh, each other for so long and we have shared this passion uh, specifically um, uh, with uh, Brit Milas of circumcision. And we've, I think we've been here when this uh, specific case in Cologne has actually happened at the same time. So this is great. Um, I will uh, give the floor uh, to um, our doctorate student, Anne-Catherine Steger, who will run the show today. I would just like to say that um, with, within the context of last week's uh, American Supreme Court, I think this is uh, very timely to discuss the ability of courts, court decisions to actually be less uh, decisive than the Bundestag decision uh, that's been taken after this court case. And we can then perhaps in the discussion also bring that into the floor. So yeah, uh, we're all here in Gison on a very sweaty, hot day, looking forward to this discussion. So please, Anne Katrin. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much all for coming. Um, I'm looking forward to the, to the talk and to the discussion very, very much. Um, and um, this is the last ABM talk of uh, this summer semester. And we're gonna have a pause for uh, September, uh, for August, and we're gonna see you again for July and September, and we're gonna see you again in September. So if you wanna know what we are up to, follow us on our website and on our Twitter and Instagram so that you know what we're gonna do in, uh, in September again. So for the structure of the ABM talk, um, we uh, have invited two guests. First, um, uh, Dr. Riedel is gonna give a talk um, and then, uh, Professor um, Shailavi is going to give a comment that is going to last about 10 minutes. Um, and this is the only part that's going to be recorded. The Q&A at the end is not going to be recorded. So everyone can feel free to chime in and um, hopefully we'll have a, an, an exciting uh, discussion. So I want to say a few brief words on our uh, discussions today. Um, Dr. Marek Riedel is a lecturer at the Macquarie Law School in Sydney in Australia, and her research is focused on social legal studies and touches especially on the private and the public aspect of religion, religious, religious and racial discrimination, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. She holds both a law degree and a master's degree in linguistics, literature and journalism from Leipzig University and has worked at the Australian National University, the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity and the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. There she did research on law, Jewish identity and the question of difference. Um, and because we are very much proponents, proponents of interdisciplinary thinking, of thinking about the power of legal structures and uh, language, we're looking forward to your talk very much. Um, Dr. Riedel's talk is going to be commented on by Professor uh, Dr. Shailavi, and he's the director of the Van Leer, uh, Jerusalem Institute, where we were guests just a month ago, and um, as well as a professor of law at the Tel Aviv University. Um, He's also the director, the, one of the directors of the Minerva Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of the End of Life. And he spe specializes in uh, sociology of law, legal theory, whereby he focuses on the ethics of living, of um, being born and of dying, and uh, the tension between secularity and religion. And um, he's worked extensively on Jewish and Muslim rights like ritual animal slaughter and um, male circumcision um, in so-called secular societies, often focusing on Germany. So I'm very excited to uh, hear from both of you and I'm gonna give over the floor to uh, Dr. Riedel first. All right, um, thank you so much for the kind introduction and thanks so much for the invitation. We can't um, hear you right now. <gasps> you cannot, can you hear me now? You look unmuted. I can hear you, so that's interesting. Okay, so who can hear me? No, sorry, yeah. Several people can hear me. That's a good start. Fantastic. <laughs> that would have been unfortunate. So good evening from Sydney. And thanks so much for the kind invitation um, to the team in Gießen to present my work here. And thank you so much um, all for joining me, even though it's, it's lunchtime for you right now. Um, I'm particularly excited to see a couple of names in this um, virtual room. Um, his work has been very inspiring to me. And so it's an honor, but also quite exciting um, to have those people um, today here in this room. Now, um, 
The topic of my talk um, takes us back to the year 2012, um, as just mentioned, and many of you will remember um, this year, um, because in this year, the German court in the city of Cologne decided that male circumcision of minors for non-therapeutical reasons constitutes a criminal assault that cannot be justified by parental consent. And even though the Bundestag, the German parliament, drafted quite quickly a new law to um, affirm the procedure's legality, it could not undo some of the social damage. Over a period of several months, there was quite an emotional and heated debate in the German public, in the media, and in the academy about the future of the practice. Because um, unlike in the United States or other anglo descent countries, like here in Australia, Germany has never endorsed routine male circumcision of boys, and it is estimated that only about 11% of German men are circumcised today, many of whom belong um, to the country's Muslim community. In German society, therefore, the practice has remained almost exclusively associated with religious minorities such as Jews and Muslims. So any discussion of male circumcision cannot be separated from its cultural baggage in the European Christian tradition and Christianity's relationship with its two um, others. So for my presentation today, I want to take this 2012 event as an opportunity to think through the relationship between Christianity and Judaism, secularism and secular law um, by focusing on the legal and political debate that surrounded this controversy. In particular, I want to propose that the circumcision debate in Germany offers us insight into how secularism and secular law contribute to maintaining religious and racial hierarchies and how this debate hints at the unfinished project of Jewish inclusion into the German secular nomos. Now, since this is a seminar series on law and anti-Semitism, I think I should clarify um, how my argument relates to these two terms. In my own work, I do not focus on anti-Semitism as an analytical lens for a number of reasons. First, because there's a risk to reduce a complex set of historical and contemporary relationships to the questions of whether something is animosity or hatred of Jews and Judaism, when the reality is often more of a spectrum of attitudes between the poles of anti and philosemitism, particularly in the German context. And so Sigmund Barman's term allosemitism, that is the idea of the Jew as inherently different might be a better vantage point. Moreover, anti-Semitism um, leads us into some of the unresolved questions around the relationship between racial anti-Semitism and religious anti-Judaism, that is concerning questions of religious and racial hierarchies, which I suggest are better considered as intertwined. So examining the encounter between Jewish difference and secular law and legal discourse gives us instead an opportunity to analyze what I will call the civilizing mission of secular law its relationship with religion race and its twin yet quite contradictory demands of assimilation, dissimulation of um, secularization and racialization. Now, um, the second term, the law. Um, I should note that my approach to law is not limited to the law and the books. Rather, drawing on my um, background in both the humanities and the law, I approach the law as a site, as a discursive resource and a pattern of arguments that enable claims to authority. In particular, my approach to law is informed by cultural studies with law that seek to understand the law as a social and cultural practice of meaning making. So the question that I'm asking is what cultural work the various arguments about the legality of infant male circumcision in the name of law perform and how they draw boundaries and enact conditions of belonging and construct self and other. So this leads me to the second aim of this um, project of which um, my this circumcision case study is a part, um, which is on how the language of secular law and liberal rights works to conceal how thoroughly imprecated the notion of secularism in the West remain with Christianity. And this is not meant to essentialize Christianity um, because the Christian norm that is lurking behind secularism will always be culturally and geographically contingent and will privilege um, some elements of the Christian tradition of others. It's also not meant to equate secularism and Christianity. And as we know from the anthropology of secularism uh, and the work of scholars such as Talal Azad, secularism is not the absence of religion or a solid wall of separation between what is religious and what is not, rather it is the governance of religion and the remaking of specific form of religious difference to fit a particular idea of what is good or acceptable religion. And this idea remains shaped and influenced by the Christian tradition. So my argument is that secular law constitutes an important vehicle to claim the protection of, we could call it Christian privilege. And this also becomes visible in the debate on circumcision. 
And as obviously, or I assume many of you in this room know, ambivalence towards Jews and Judaism forms a really important part of the Christian tradition. Because throughout its history, Christianity formulated its identity in opposition to Jews and Judaism and tried to remake Jews through conversion, assimilation, or elimination. And then the secularization of Christian societies, however, did not present such a dramatic rupture with this ambivalent past as we might like to think. Um, in fact, as Ari Oskowitz and Ethan Katz have argued, many of the dichotomies that have characterized the Christian antagonism towards Judaism continue to underpin secular thought and secular law, and thereby rendering some religions and identities more acceptable to, secular liber to liberal secular legality than others. Now, in what follows, I want to focus on two sides of contestation in the uh, German circumcision debate, the idea, uh, idea of the secular body and the, of the idea of religion where these dynamics become apparent. Uh, I need to make one caveat. Uh, my reading is not meant to represent the entire debate or to suggest that genuine concerns about children's rights are somewhat unimportant. My focus is obviously selective because I'm interested and I'm tracing a particular pattern of arguments. Um, without thereby discarding the relevance of other equally important concerns. All right, the first side, the secular body. So throughout the uh, debate, um, it became apparent that the uncircumcised body was often presented as the secular and universal norm that is devoid of any particularities of religion and culture. For example, there was a proposal made that the body should that uh, the boy should decide for himself when he's 18 or 14, which is the age of um, religious majority or religionsmündigkeit in German law, um, when German uh, when children can decide for themselves which religion at all, if any at all, they wish to adopt. So this proceeds this proposal however well-meaning, posits the unmarked body as the secular and neutral state of being that enables then all future choices, and thereby renders the uncircumcised body as the universal norm. However, obviously postponing or abandoning circumcision is also not a neutral act either. From the Jewish and the Muslim perspective, being uncircumcised is not simply the characteristic of a secular and neutral body that is devoid of religion, but rather it reflects a very Christian understanding of the body at least in continental Europe, which may explain why circumcision, circumcision has been much less of a contentious issue in the US, despite the strong influence of Protestant normativity on US American law. So leaving the body uncircumcised does not necessarily mean leaving the body open to all possible um, choices later in life, but it can also mean inscribing majority Christian norms onto the child's body, um, a process that um, the English scholar Didi Herman has described as conversion. Being uncircumcised, then I would suggest, has to be considered as much as a particularistic choice rooted in a particular religion and culture as being circumcised. In early Christianity, Jewish circumcision marked a division between the two, as evidenced in, in the writings of Paul. And Paul actually made an interesting appearance in the debate. In the constitutional law commentary, we are told the story of human progress that replicates the Christian narrative of Judaism's supersession by Christianity. In this commentary, quote, circumcision replaced human sacrifice, just as on the, quote, next evolutionary step, the early Christian community replaced the bodily ritual of circumcision with baptism, a, I quote again, gender comprehensive practice through which circumcision endured as the, quote, circumcision of the heart. So two things stand out in this argument, direct link between Christianity and the modern secular state, allegedly both committed to progressive liberal values such as gender equality and the invocation of a Christian text within a commentary on secular constitutional law in Germany, making thereby the Christian roots of the secular states quite explicit. Christianity becomes like the secular state associated with gender equality through its gender re neutral ritual of baptism. Again, this idea is not new and echoes maybe unconsciously what Paul had to say about circumcision in contrast to baptism. For Paul, as the scholar Shai Cohen explained, circumcision discriminates, baptism does not. Now we could read the German circumcision debate with its um, Protestant Christian echoes merely as a return to an earlier religious discourse about circumcision as a sign of Judaism inferiority that now re reappears in the language of secular law. However, reading this case only as an expression of religious ambivalence would conceal the racializing dynamics at work. 
Historically, the racialization of Jewish bodies has often drawn on Christian theological discourse, and there remains an intricate connection between secularism and racializing processes even today. This connection is particularly apparent in political and legal responses to Muslim practices today, where religious symbols and signs, such as, for example, the headscarf, have become inscribed with essentialized racial meanings of foreignness, fundamentalism, and inequality all in the uh, register of cultural racism. Shireen Razak has described the secular religious divide as functioning almost like color line that marks, I quote her, the difference between the white modern enlightened West and people of color in particular Muslim. And I would argue that we can observe a similar racialization of both Jews and Muslims in the German debate that often it's established a binary between an enlightened, secular, modern and rational us and a pre-modern, illiberal, religious violent them. For example, several public and legal commentators link circumcision to violence or even abuse. A German NGO for children called Kinderhilfe, aid for children, argued that a law allowing circumcision would allow religiously motivated child abuse. So circumcising parents are placed in a position of criminals who need to be civilized and disciplined by German law. Media cartoons echoed this stance by showing Jews and Muslims as hook-nosed and bearded figures armed with bloody knives and scissors, repeating old anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim tropes. We also encountered the term um, genital mutilation in relation to male circumcision, a term that draws on the language that dominates the Western discourse and practices of female genital cutting in which the term female genital mutilation already emphasizes a particular position that the practice is absolutely unjustifiable. Now, labeling an act as mutilation is cruel or inhumane not only constructs this act within a particular um, semantic paradigm, but it also provides a justification for intervention and silences the voices of those who are labeled in this way and replaces their own interpretation experiences and worldview. Engaging with cultural and religious difference always involves the question of who speaks and what can be said and whose voice is silenced. And in the German case, there was quite a loud uncircumcised uh, majority and a small group of circumcised men had re expressed regrets about their circumcision who dominated the debate. While it's of course important to consider these voices, their selective perception creates a distorted image of the multiple experiences of circumcision among Jews and Muslims alike. Quite similar to the Muslim headscarf, the sign of circumcision becomes essentialized into a reductive reading as a mark of illiberalism and oppression. In an article from 2012, in a, an article from 2012 in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz entitled "Even in Israel, more and more parents choose not to circumcise their sons," was often cited by critics in Germany to support their argument that even Jews had growing doubts about the procedure, thereby creating a distinction between good Jews who are willing to reform and bad Jews who insist on their tradition. Critics, however, hardly ever mention that the article described not only a small, uh, described only a small segment of the Jewish Israeli population, but they also failed to mention how it occurs within the context of the Jewish majority society. In this co context, Jewish identity is more secure, less threatened with assimilation than in a society dominated by Christianity. In such a cultural context, alternative expression of Jewish identity carry much less, less of an assimilatory connotation, but can be read as counter-hegemonic practices that seek to challenge dominant um, norms. Um, I always like to quote here um, the American author Philip Roth, um, or rather his protagonist Nathan Zuckerman from um, the 1986 novel The Counter Life. And, and Nathan Zuckerman states that only a few hours ago, I went so far as to tell Shuki El Hanan that the custom of circumcision was probably irrelevant to my eye. Well, it turns out to be easier to uh, take that line on Dizengoff Street than sitting here besides the Thames. Here it turns out by my emotional logic to be the number one priority. The German debate also demonstrated the Eurocentric nature of ideas about religion, which becomes evident in how religion was imagined by circumcision critics. Throughout the debate, circumcision is rearticulated from a religious ritual to a health risk reflecting the general shift of Western society since its enlightenment from a culture of religious belief to a culture of med medical and scientific knowledge. In a German debate, there was a tendency to privilege medical knowledge um, as legitimate and authoritative, while religious knowledge was 
ignored as irrelevant or illegitimate. A good example is the comment made by the then um, Federal Commissioner for Human Rights, Marcus Learning, on his Facebook page, who wrote, too stupid to understand science, try religion. A framing in mostly medical terms enables a move from considerations about religious identity and community to a cost-benefit analysis in terms of health, reiterating certain forms of knowledge as modern, secular, while discarding others as pre-modern, and therefore irrelevant and irrational. Yet even secular scientific knowledge is to some extent culturally, uh, culturally contingent. The disagreement between various pediatric bodies across the West on whether harms outweigh the benefits of circumcision or vice versa remains tied to the socio-cultural context as the diverging opinions of medical associations in the United States on the one hand and continental European countries such as Germany on the other show. Other commentators suggested that religious practices have to be rationally justifiable. And we could read this as a sign of a disenchanted society um, where re organized religion matters less and is less convincing. However, rationalizing particularly rationalizing religion particularly targets certain and groups for whom religion is not just a matter of inner belief, but rather a practice which is necessarily to some extent public and therefore always more prone to the scrutiny of public reason. Such a view therefore privileges religion as a matter of inner faith, um, voluntary and not compulsory, a notion with which Judaism has never easily fit because it has historically been about law and practice and therefore in many ways necessarily public. And so the idea that Judaism is a religion in the sense of inner private belief is in fact rather new and emerged during the period of emancipation as a prerequisite um, for Jewish access to citizenship, the period that saw the invention of Judaism as a religion to use the title of Lior Benitsky's book. But the notional transformation of Judaism in a religion in this sense, it never completely resolved the tensions around Judaism's public aspects, such as the practice of circumcision. And this tension now plays out in the circumcision debate in which Jews again face the demand to privatize the difference into a matter of belief in order to fully belong into the modern um, liberal nation state. These tensions are, of course, not unique to Judaism, but in fact, all religions such as Islam that do not fit such a privatized model of religion, a model that it's important to note is not in fact even um, strictly supported by German constitutional law to bring, uh, doctrine on freedom of religion. How am I going with time? Still good? <laughs> so given the difficulty with legal definitions of religion, um, German law workers were um, probably quite wise to avoid any reference to um, religion as a requirement for the validity of parental consent when they drafted the new regulation on male circumcision in the civil code. And a new regulation, however, immediately attracted a new criticism that it would pave, as one commentary put it, the way for, I quote, all kinds of shoddy or outright wicked motives on the parents' side. At the hence, a proposal was made that parents could be asked to provide reasons for why male circumcision forms an integral part of their educational concept. But restricting the law to only allow for religious um, circumcision would face serious practical difficulties. How is religion to be defined? And how would parents prove their religiosity? Is it the frequency of synagogue or mosque attendance or keeping kosher? What would Jewish mean in this context? The idea of such a religious observance test is again informed by a Christian understanding of Christian identity, in which someone is understood to be religious who participates in the observance of religious practice. But this understanding does of course not sit easily with the way that Judaism defines the Jewishness of a person. Despite the internal pluralism of Judaism, almost all Jewish denominations agree that a person is Jewish either by birth or by conversion, although they may differ on the exact criteria. One final point, um, this being Germany, and I think this is important also to um, look at, um, the debate could not avoid the Holocaust and its meaning for contemporary law. So for some commentators, the Third Reich and its carelessness for human life required an absolute protection of human life and bodily integrity under the German constitution. Marlene Ruprecht, who was back then the spokesperson for children's rights in the Social Democratic Party, argued that she did not wish Germany to become known for being the country that legalized the violation of bodies of vulnerable children because of, I quote, random biblical sources and ancient tra traditions, quote, continues the respect for human life. This is our lesson from the Nazi era. So the lesson to be drawn from the atrocities of the Holocaust is the absolute protection of human rights, even if this means the protection of Jewish children from their Jewish parents. Ultimately, this reasoning 
exposes again a Eurocentric and paternalistic view of the German state's responsibility for its Jewish citizens, whereby the state has to eradicate their differences in order to protect them from themselves. Other commentators framed the question as one of special rights for Jews due to the Holocaust. One member of the German Ethics Council described the circumcision controversy as a, I quote, legal and political state of emergency that forced Germany to create a special law just for Jews and Muslims. From this perspective, allowing circumcision becomes a mere concession to Jews because of historical guilt, or as another commentator suggested, because of a free floating constitutional taboo clause. This argument is also worrisome because it emphasizes once more the otherness of Jew by rendering the new regulation that confirms the legality of um, circumcision as a special law, which stands outside or even in opposition to the German legal order. It is an argument that continues to enforce dichotomies between our law and their tradition and the idea of a normus to which we belong, but they do not. And in treating the legal permission to circumcise as Jewish special law, the legal discussion of real is other semitism and that, as Lisbon Bauman noted, singles out, singles out Jews as others who need special treatment in the form of special laws and measures. Let me conclude here with some final observation. So my aim when this presentation was to point at some of the hidden assumptions between the normal body and the truly modern religion or with quotation marks and how these notions remain implicated with a secularized naturalized Christianity and the racialization of Jewish and Muslims bodies. To be clear, the arguments analyzed here do not represent the entire debate, but they do represent an important line of argument and reveal how legal reasoning can draw on an older cultural repertoire that reproduces religious and racial hierarchies. The debate also shows a lingering expectations produced to dissolve into sameness with nominally Christian Germans in the name of constitutional rights. So my argument here is not that the law is anti-Semitic or that the arguments of individuals in this debate are anti-Semitic or racist. I think here the insights of feminist legal theory or critical race theory are quite instructive because they help us to understand that the law, both in, in its practice and as a discipline, I cite why ideas about difference such as gender, race, and I would add religion are produced and reproduced through the implicit, unarticulated, often unconscious societal assumptions that we bring to our understanding and interpretation of the law. So consequently, this is not about individual prejudice, but about how our Christian tradition, however secular we may, we may think we are, continues to shape our assumptions about religion and the boundaries of acceptable religious difference. So one final note on Islam in the debate. I would argue that the persistence of references to Judaism and the echoes of older Christian ambivalence towards Jews um, shows that Jews did not merely constitute collateral damage in a debate primarily aimed at Muslims, as has been suggested. However, we cannot understand this debate without considering uh, that the initial court decision concerned the Muslim boy. And of course, the debate about the integration of Islam in Germany that had been ongoing and continues to go on. While in comparison often drawn between historical antisemitism and contemporary Islamophobia, I think the circumcision case in fact reveals how the Jewish and the Muslim question remain um, somewhat intertwined. Although well, this case also reveals hierarchies of Semitic religious difference in German society. In fact, a new law affirming the legality of male circumcision draws a subtle distinction between Jews and Muslims. The law distinguishes between Jewish and Islamic circumcision by catering through its Mohel clause to the specific needs of the Jewish community. This clause allows a traditional circumciser to perform the circumcision on a boy less than six months of age, which accommodates the Jewish um, tradition of circumcising eight days after a boy's birth. Islam, where circumcision occurs much later, usually between childhood to early puberty, is not granted such an exception. This is similar to the Swedish regulation and also requires a medical professional to carry out the surgery unless the child is under the age of two months. The point is here not whether a medical professional is indeed better suited to perform a circumcision, but rather to whom an exception is granted and to whom not. And although the explanatory comment that accompanied the draft law suggests that the majority of Muslims in Germany have their sons circumcised in a hospital or by a physician, no convincing medical rationale is provided for this distinction. One may also ponder whether the fact that the debate equally concerned Jews and Muslims may also have influenced its resolution through parliamentary intervention. Would the Bundestag have acted as swiftly to prevent Germany from becoming a laughing stock as Angela Merkel um, worried? 
Um, if only Muslims practice circumcision, does the new law merely rectify an unfortunate judicial error and affirm the unconditional belonging of Jews in Germany, from which Muslims benefit in this case too? Several commentators saw the new law not as an affirmation of Jewish and Muslim belonging, but rather as an act of political mercy. From this point of view, the legal accommodation of a central Jewish right is not a result of Jewish privilege belonging or even a pluralistic vision of German society that includes both Jews and Muslims. Rather, it is an attempt to preserve Germany's image abroad in which a philosemitic embrace um, of Jews testifies to the country's successful democratic transition while glossing over the persistent religious and racial hierarchies that continue to cut through the German secular norms. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for mapping out the discourse and um, I will go over the, the mic to uh, Professor Shailavi um, and your comment. Thank you, thank you so much uh, Dr. Riedel for this illuminating uh, discussion of circumcision in, in Germany. And um, as it turns out, uh, I'm extremely sympathetic uh, to the general framework, overall framework of your presentation, as well as to many of the arguments that you've uh, made. So uh, my comment will be in some ways more adding on rather than challenging uh, things you've uh, said, so perhaps reinforcing in other contexts uh, some of the things you said, but I, but I do want to come back towards the end to the normative question, which you did not directly address, which I think is, is also important in this, in this conversation. So uh, in my own work, uh, I also worked on circumcision, but I want to expand a little bit our perspective on circumcision uh, in Germany, both in terms of looking at other practices in Germany, not only circumcision, and also looking at circumcision, but not only in Germany. Um, and so I think these two broadening of perspectives will allow us to position the German case uh, a better. Uh, and I think reinforces uh, some of the points that you've made and makes other points as well. So I'm happy you ended your talk with the question of Muslims, because I do think that this is a matrix and that the, word, that the framework of other, otherness and the dichotomization doesn't quite capture uh, the multi-layeredness of, uh, of this complexity where uh, Jews are others, but Muslims, as in this case and in other cases, for example, the animal slaughter case, which is also important, are discriminated among the discriminated. So there, there's a double discrimination uh, in the German context going against Muslims, which is also important for understanding the positioning of Jews in this. And, and I think you're right on the mark when you uh, distance yourself from talking about anti-Semitism as the framework, uh, because it, it's, more, it's more complicated, uh, as you noted. Um, so with, with animal slaughter, some of the points that you, you made are reinforced. Uh, there's clearly a, a long-term Christian polemic against Jewish practices of slaughtering and sacrifice, and indeed, a substitution of the sacrifice of Jesus for the sacrifice of animals, uh, which carries on into the modern into the modern context, similarly to the polemics against uh, circumcision. And there's also this joint practice of Jews and Muslims, so both Jews and Muslims practice circumcision in a way, and also animal slaughter. And there's also the same kind of double discrimination against the Muslims in this context. So by the same token that when Muslims want to circumcise their children in Berlin, they go to the Jewish hospital. Uh, similarly, for many years, when Muslims wanted to slaughter, they couldn't do it under the law because uh, there was a discrimination against Muslims from practicing slaughter, but Jews were allowed. And so uh, Muslims would go to Jewish butchers. And there's a court decision, an interesting uh, administrative court from 1983 by the, uh, in Gelsenkirchen, which explains why Jews are allowed and Muslims are prohibited, which is worthwhile uh, quoting just very briefly. The permission for Jews to slaughter represents an act of political, culture, and humanitarian compensation to the Jews who are still alive, the noch lebenden Juden. And that's the first argument. And then the Jewish religion has in Germany a greater historical tradition than the Muslims. Jews have integrated more or less into the German people, folk, as Germans, 
with essentially the same rights and duties. So there is a, there's a history of this double standard treatment of Jews and Muslims in the German context, which I think helps shed light on the question of, uh, of, of circumcision. And so I would say from the beginning, we need to discuss both, uh, especially with these practices. Um, then there's, so that's comparing circumcision with other, with other uh, Jewish and Muslim rights. The, the other comparison is to look at Germany and German regulation of, of circumcision while placing it uh, in, in comparison with other secular countries with a different religious background. So let's say Israel with a Jewish background and Turkey with a Muslim background. And, and to talk about <clears throat> what is medicalization doing here? So the medicalization is really important and the interaction between medicine and law is, is, is crucial for bridging between facts and norms. So there's a way in which uh, the medical field and medical insight actually is an important link between the facticity of the body and the normativity, the normative way in which we think about the body. And so medicine, in a, at least a specific version of medicine, tells us what is a complete body, a whole body, what is an infringement of the body, what are the medical standards that need to be taken in place, uh, the use of anesthetics, the professionalization of, of the practice of circumcision, uh, for example. But it's equally true about uh, transgender and the way that the medicalization actually is uh, a discourse of normalization in which we know what are normal bodies and how to normalize uh, bodies. And, and I think that when you look at the, the interface between medicalization and the religious secular question, which you raised in the paper, it's really interesting to see how medicalization fits into this. And in the German context, clearly medicalization is used as a secular uh, trope, as a secular force. Uh, secularizing, secularizing the practice. In Israel, there's a whole other context for uh, circumcision. First of all, circumcision is not regulated at all. And it's, it's, it's more difficult to become a car mechanic than a circumciser. You actually need a certificate to be, to be a car mechanic, but not to be a circumciser. And also, it's not considered to be a medical procedure at all in principle. And hence, there's no need for um, uh, medical uh, authority in this context. But secular people circumcise, and often even the most secular atheists in Israel, Jews, circumcise. And the way that they do it is by going to a medical doctor who is also a circumciser. So medicalization is used there in, in, in a different way. And if you compare to Turkey, even more extreme case of the use of medicalization, not to secularize the body, but actually to sanctify the public sphere, and, and the way that that works is that Arduan, for many years, circumcision um, moved to the hands of the doctors, but it was prohibited to practice circumcision in public hospitals because uh, Turkey was understood to be a secular state. Uh, and so no circumcision, no religious practice goes into a public hospital. But Erdogan, as part of the attempt to reintroduce religion into the public sphere, actually introduce circumcision into public hospitals. And there you could see medicalization as working not as a force of secularization, but rather as a force of sanctification. So it's not just about whether we're enlightened and whether we use science, but it's exact, it, it's the, the, the specific permutation of this relationship between science, secular, secularization and, and religion, which I think is really, uh, really interesting. Uh, and the final point <clears throat> that I want to make uh, concerns the normative part of the, of the argument, not of your argument, but of the debate. And I think you did, you, you uh, took a wise step by sidestepping the normative question. And, and you said, I'm using this case just to highlight something else that interests me. And I'm not passing judgment on the question of whether circumcision is prohibited or not, should be prohibited or not, or not even whether the court got it right or wrong, uh, but simply what underlies the logic of the court. But it's hard to hold that position all the way through because when you talk about this, you know, discrimination, othering, racialization, 
you, it's very hard to then say, but I'm not passing judgment on these on these questions. And so, uh, so I think, uh, and I don't have an answer. I just want to, uh, in two minutes, re re reiterate what I understand to be the framework of the question. So one thing is to say, as you said, for a historian or for a critical sociologist, it's really interesting to see these continuities between the Christian heritage and the polemic and contemporary discussions. But it's also important not to identify between the two and not to conflate the two, because there are other reasons, and I think these should be brought to the surface, that have very little to do with Christianity and have more to do with the rise of the modern state and its uh, monopol monopolization over the use of, uh, of violence, as well as the positivization of religion, which is really important. So for example, um, as in your case, for the Jews, the eighth day to practice circumcision is binding law. For the Muslims, when to practice circumcision is actually an open-ended question from a positivistic perspective. Different communities have their traditions, but that's somehow uh, disregarded as important because there's no clear laws. And so I think that there, there are really interesting aspects of the modern state and how modern state interacts with religion that may have a Christian background, but also need to be understood on their own terms, which leads then to the, to the point in which one could argue, along with Talal Assad, I think, that every universalization, like liberalism, is actually not universal, but is a universalization from a particular perspective. But what more, is my question, can we ask from the Christian state? Uh, right? I mean, what, isn't it, isn't it good enough, I'm asking, isn't it good enough to move beyond Christianity, to try and universalize the standards, to create universal standards? Of course, nothing is truly universal, but it's clearly also not simply imposing Christian standards. So I think that this is an important question to ask, whether the universalization goes in liberal terms as in, in Germany or in different terms as in Turkey or in Israel, the question remains as to how exactly should states be run. One answer is don't universalize. Leave it to politics as the Bundestag ended up doing, right? Let's not try to solve these big problems by universal general principles that law that courts can apply. Let's go to politics. That's a solution, but that has its own problems. And so I'm putting this on the table for further discussion. Thank you again. This is great.